Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning into my talk. Uh, my name is Reed Swanson, and I'm an assessment biologist for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Today, I'm presenting a talk entitled Determining Connectivity Between the Boardman River, Grand Traverse Bay, and Lake Michigan Proper in Support of Fish Pass. I'm presenting this work on behalf of my collaborators listed here on the screen. This work is a supplemental research project of the larger Fish Pass project. More information on the Fish Pass project can be found via the QR code on the screen or through viewing Dr. Dan Zielinski's talk earlier in this session. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge all the collaborating agencies that are involved in the larger Fish Pass project, as well as some of them that are involved in this work, as it represented by the logos here on the screen. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has provided a lot of the financial support for the Fish Pass project, but this work was specifically funded through the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission's Fisheries Research Program. I would now like to explain some of the objectives and methods of our project. We believe that the endeavor of achieving selective connectivity at Fish Pass carries with it the obligation to evaluate the effects of that enhanced connectivity on associated fisheries and ecosystem functions. The question of how enhanced connectivity affects fisheries production in the Great Lakes is critical to research managers, but much broader and long term than can be addressed by a single research project. Therefore, our project proposed to establish a framework and specifically address the spatio-temporal patterns of fish movement between Tributary Bay and Lake Basin as it relates to productivity of the system and the dynamics of the abiotic variables associated with said movement. To understand this, we're using acoustic telemetry. The addition of acoustic telemetry to our initial radio and pit tag telemetry exploration and fish pass that we conducted in 2018 and 2021 offered some significant benefits. In particular, it offered us a better spatial coverage of the estuary and lake habitats and improved our ability to find when fish become spatially available for entry. And more generally, it allowed us um, to gain information on where these fish are coming from and going to when they're not utilize, utilizing the Borman River. This has obvious management implications as restoring connectivity, in particular the spawning migrations, has the potential Im impact of providing recruitment to various fi fisheries stocks out in the bay or lake. Further, when we start to talk about ecosystem level consequences, we can start to think about the broader nutrient and product productivity cycling. The specific deliverables of our work to, were to establish the proportion of fish tagged and released in the Borman River that are subsequently detected elsewhere in Grand Traverse Bay and Outer Lake Michigan ecosystems. To do this, we're using a residency and multi-state mark recapture modeling approach. Second was to understand the extent and timing of fish movement into and out of the Borman River using descriptive statistics. And then lastly, we, we plan to parameterize a proportional hazards model to understand the influence of abiotic variables that cue entry and exit to the river um, itself. Today I'll focus on the first two deliverables for a majority of my talk. In order to accomplish these goals, we first had to tag some fish. This work was slated to start in 2020, and as you can imagine, that resulted in some logistical hiccups. We had an original target goal of tagging 40 lake trout, rainbow trout, longnose sucker, white sucker, and walleye. We switched walleye to smallmouth bass due to some unforeseen staffing limitations in the spring of 2021 in which we were unable to get out and capture our walleye for tagging. Smallmouth bass we knew generally came into the river later in the year, so we identified them as a logistically feasible alternative to walleye. However, despite this change, we still failed to hit our target numbers for both lake trout and smallmouth bass with only about 30 individuals tagged for each species. As a result of battery uh, life loss due to shelf storage and the time constraints of our proposed monitoring network, we decided to stratify the remaining tags across the other species to bolster their sample sizes and still get valuable information out of the tags we had already purchased. I also note we never planned to tag lake surgeon. Lake surgeon had been identified as a priority species for restoration, restoration as part of the larger Bourbon River Restoration Project. However, their presence is extremely limited in the system at present time. In 2021, two individuals were observed in the river and we just happened to encounter one when we were out tagging suckers. So with the blessing of the project, project partners and the managing authorities, we implanted this large female lake surgeon with a transmitter in hopes of gaining some knowledge on where the surgeon that do enter the Borman River are going to and coming from. While those are the original sample sizes of the number of tags we implanted by species, we have had 14 of our fish captured and reported by anglers, of which 11 were reported as harvested. 
And so to relate back to these stars on the table that caveat survival, it's important to point out that some of our rainbow trout, lake trout, and smallmouth bass never had the chance to leave the river post-tagging before being harvested by members of the public. However, we're defining survival or a basic understanding of post-tag survival uh, through an evaluation of volitional movements outside of the river to assert that a fish truly survived. So these numbers of fish being harvested before they left the river actually artificially decreases our estimates of survival. Overall, the survival of tagged fish looked fairly good with over 90% um, survival across all species. I wanted to briefly familiarize everyone with the Bourbon River system and the general area of this project. It's located here in the northwest corner of Michigan's Lower Peninsula and drains a roughly 287 square mile area into Lake Michigan via Traverse City and uh, Grand Traverse Bay. So what does our monitoring network look like? We essentially used our entire project budget to purchase the fish transmitters and 13 acoustic receivers, which are indicated by the triangle symbols on the screen. We were leveraging the fact that some Corrigonid work was beginning in Grand Traverse Bay near the same time that we initiated this project, and so we were able to use their receivers to our benefit. So generally speaking, this is Grand Traverse Bay here, and then this is the Lower Borman River system. Um, and here's the site of the future fish pass site. So we inv invested most of our resources into receivers within the river itself and in the estuary area, as well as this gate-like deployment at the terminal end of West Bay. We're also augmenting our detections to the use of pit tag telemetry as all of our fish received a pit tag transmitter as well as an acoustic transmitter. We then started to bend these spatial receivers into what we're calling connectivity zones as indicated by the colors in the key. And so we have West Grand Traverse Bay, the most immediate um, area to the Bourbon River system, Outer Grand Traverse Bay here in red, East Grand Traverse Bay in blue, and then the, the Greater Lake Michigan um, area out here as designated by purple. And so as we start to zoom out in the spatial extent that we're looking at, we can see um, that there's a much larger network um, thanks to the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Ob Observation System network. So this map is the regional GLaDOS network that was online at some point during our study period, as indicated by the circle symbols on the map. More information on the GLaDOS network can be found via the QR code on the screen. So during our study period, additional receivers have come online in the offshore areas that have strengthened our ability to detect fish and analyze our data. And as a teaser to what's to come, um, all the symbols that are filled in in green here have been um, have detected one of our fish during the study system. And we also had to add an additional area of Lake Huron as some of our lake trout moved through the Straits of Mackinac and over into Lake Huron. So what does this data look like? Um, here's an example of what's known as an abacus plot or detection history. In this plot, on the x-axis we have time and on the y-axis we have categorical labels to the receivers that are out in the network. And this fish is a rainbow trout that makes a couple of good points. We tagged this fish in the fall of 2020 and then it actually remained resident in the Bourbon River Kids Creek over the winter um, before exiting in May of 2021. It then made some fairly large spatial movements out into Lake Michigan as far as the Northern Lake Trout Refuge, and then made some pretty big back and forth movements up, up and down the Michigan shoreline of Lake Michigan. Before its return in January of 2022 to the Bourbon River, at which point it was captured and released by an angler in January, and then a few weeks later it was captured and harvested by another angler. And so this is a, a, just a good example of what, what the raw data outputs kind of look like as we start to analyze this data. Circling back to our first objective, we can start to visualize the different connectivity zone use across species. And what we notice from doing this is that lake trout and rainbow trout have a higher propensity to use the areas further away from the Borman River relative to some of the other species. Um, in contrast, the smallmouth bass and white sucker generally stay fairly localized to West Traverse Bay with the exception of a few individuals. Longnose sucker, on the other hand, show a generally intermediate trend to the other species with 38% um, moving out to outer Grand Traverse Bay, 17% to Lake Michigan, and 14% to the east arm of Grand Traverse Bay. And so I wanted to use them as an example moving forward in some of our analysis to get into what the, these movements are, are showing us in a, a bit more detail. So this is what's known as a global residency plot. And this plot is for long nose suckers. And so what we have here is we have data on the X axis and then the percent of tags that we implanted on the Y. The colors in the figure correspond to the connectivity zones that a fish was present in on a given day. So each one of these tiny little uh, vertical bars represents a day in the detection history of our receivers. The additional colors from the last uh, figure are this black and white color, and the black essentially means that fish were censored from the data set. 
The censoring criteria that we're using here is if a fish hasn't been heard from anywhere on the monitoring network for over one calendar year. And then the white represents a, a lack of detections on a given fish within one of these vertical bars or one, or one of these days. And so what we see here is that we tagged all of our long-nosed sucker um, in the spring of 2021, and about 48% returned in 2022, and then 52% returned um, in 2023. However, we can go ahead and remove our censored individuals and just talk about the fish that are available in our monitoring network as we move forward. So essentially I remove those black and white colors from the plot and we can see a greater proportion of the fish are actually returning in 2023 relative to 2022. We can also see a couple of unique things. So immediately after the spring migration, we see a pretty fast outward movement of a proportion of our population out into outer Grand Traverse Bay and Lake Michigan proper in both years. Um, but then bef before they return, you know, they start to come back to West Bay prior to their entry into the river, which makes sense. You have to come through West Traverse Bay to enter the Boardman River. And so I started to, to explore this a little further. And what, what we noticed is that drop in return rate in 2022 relative to 2023 was actually driven by a lack of females. So this is the same plot, but bifurcated by the sex of the individual. So on the top, we have male, on the bottom, we have female. And so we see this notable drop and only 20% of our female long nose sucker returned in 2022, where 80% returned in 2023. In contrast to the males that remain fairly um, consistent with about 70% of the males returning uh, across the two years um, at which they possibly could return. Another thing we notice is that when the females didn't return, when we have this drop in return rate, we see that a proportion of them are remaining in those, those more distant areas further from the river itself. Um, so what this suggests to me is that, you know, we might have some uh, skipping going on. Some of the females may choose not to make an investment in reproduction in some years and the years that they are deciding to skip, um, they don't necessarily make the same movements back towards the West Grand Traverse Bay or the river area. We can then use the acoustic detection data to look at return rates or the extent of return outlined in objective two. The table presented here is the identified return rates of individuals across any year subsequent to tagging. The number I use to include in these calculations accounts for the reported harvest and censoring of a fish when it wasn't detected for an entire year previous to a given uh, migratory period of expected return. And what we see across the two years of study is that return rates are over 50% for most species, with the exception of lake trout and lake sturgeon. Interestingly enough, though, I caveat the lake sturgeon number with the fact that our single lake sturgeon has returned to the Borman River estuary every year post-tagging, but has yet to enter the river in any of these years post-tagging. After identifying the return and exit events as outlined here in the dashed line, we can then start to characterize the timing at which these events occur, which is the next component of our second objective. As a sorting system, it's helpful for fish pests to understand the times at which we may be sorting each species, particularly when they start to become available and when they leave the river. In this box and whisker plot, we have the date on the x-axis and the species on the y-axis. The darker shading represents the interquartile range for entry, while the lighter uh, shading represents the IQR for exit. As we move from the bottom of the plot up to the top, we notice that lake trout have the most truncated range and are really only coming into the river for a three-week period in late October, early November. This coincides with the potential beginning of their spawning period. Next, smallmouth bass are coming into the river in early to mid-June most commonly. This likely coincides with either their spawning or post-spawning time period. Third, we can look at the two species of sucker, and we know for the fact that the species of sucker are spawning as we can actively see this from the banks of the river. We notice across these two species that the long-nosed sucker come in a much more synchronized manner and are really only present or entering and exiting the river for a few weeks of time, whereas the white sucker migration appears to be more protracted in nature. Both of these trends align very nicely with some of our previous radio and pit tag telemetry work, as well as some of the residency modeling that I pre presented earlier a couple of slides ago. Lastly, as we look at rainbow trout, you might notice that they demonstrate the widest dispersion of entry and exit behaviors um, relative to the other species. This is actually an artifact of this more or less bimodal behavior we've observed in which some fish are coming in in the late fall for short bits of time or even overwintering in the river before the primary run occurs in the springtime period in April and May.
I also briefly want to present the quantile distribution of our detection data um, as a whole. So this differs from the last plot in that there is no more sh um, shadowing of for entry and exits, but this rather shows presence in the river um, rather than entry and exit. And so this is a good way to visualize when fish are being detected within the river itself. So while entry and exit of individuals can be informative to sorting, it's also important to account for those that remain resident in the river. And the main thing that jumps out of, out of this plot to me is the near omnipresent detection of rainbow trout in contrast to the other species, which appear to be much more migratory in nature. Although we do see some level of year round presence of smallmouth bass as well, not nearly as pronounced as that that we see in the rainbow trout. Our next step in our project is to model the abiotic variable influence on river entry and exit in a proportional mo hazards model framework. I'm currently working on this and evaluating some of the time intervals, covariate effects, and spatial definitions of when a fish truly becomes available for entry. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation and leave our contact information here as I play through some animations of fish movement. As you'll notice, the species uh, label changes on the title of a plot as it progresses through the different species animations.